All right, there we go. So hi, everyone, and welcome to the third Azure Chalk Talk. Uh, we are fortunate for this session to have Mike Hacker, who is a cloud solution architect, has done a lot with uh, website development and, and website migration, working with customers actually for uh, w over two years, so wealth of experience. Um, we're fortunate to have Mike present today, and he's going to He's going to show us a lot about how to migrate a, a website. I know a lot of folks have expressed interest in that. And then also um, something called Azure Websites, which you may or may not be familiar with. And he's, uh, he's going to go into that as well. So with that introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Mike to take the lead. Thanks, Mike. All righty. Uh, everybody hear me OK? Yeah. All right, excellent. So yeah, my name is uh, Michael Hacker. I'm a cloud solution architect for Microsoft State and Local Government. A uh, little bit of background. I uh, Before I came to Microsoft, I was a consultant. Uh, that was about six plus years ago. And uh, as a consultant, I worked a lot with uh, SharePoint and custom app development. Uh, so, you know, dealing with websites and, and uh, you know, getting them stood up uh, was kind of all part of my job back then. And so it's kind of cool to see how things have kind of evolved over the uh, the years from a website website hosting. Um, so what I want to do today is really give you a good understanding about what Azure websites are inside of our Microsoft Azure environment. It's a little different than some of the hosting uh, providers that you might have used in the past, which would be like uh, maybe a GoDaddy or something like that for a website. Um, some of the concepts are similar, but we offer a lot of additional capabilities and functionality that uh, you know, hosters like that don't offer. Um, so to kind of get started a little bit, when we talk about Azure websites, um, we're talking about a platform as a service capability. So that's uh, PaaS. You might see that out there and about um, you know in different documentation stuff like that. And what that really means is that. Microsoft is managing all of the underlying infrastructure for you. The only thing that you have to worry about is going to be your application and your data that's going to be sitting up on top of the services that are running uh, in Azure, in, in particular for the Azure website. So that's what a platform as a service is. It's where Microsoft manages all the underlying uh, components. So that would be the networking components, the um, operating system, the hardware, all of that stuff's managed for you. The only thing that you will be doing is configuration and then, of course, deploying your application. So what I'm going to do today is actually walk through um, what that looks like. And we're going to skip uh, slides today. So so no slides. We're not going to bore people uh, with slideware today. We're going to actually jump into uh, Azure to uh, demonstrate um, what that uh, looks like. So. Um, what I'm going to do here first is come over to my browser, and um, you know, there's two different uh, Azure environments depending on uh, our customer's use. We have Azure Commercial and Azure Government. Uh, today, I'm going to demonstrate everything in our Azure Commercial environment. However, if you have an Azure Government subscription, the majority of what I'm showing you today uh, applies. Uh, there is a couple small minor differences, and as we go through those differences, uh, you know, I'll, I'll call them out so, so that you're well aware of what, what those differences are. So the first thing that I'm going to do here is uh, connect to my Azure portal. So I just went to portal.azure.com. Um, because we're using uh, ADFS at Microsoft and single sign-on, of course, it allows me straight in because I'm logged in on my local machine. Um, if you don't have all of that set up, you might be prompted, of course, when you go to portal.azure.com to enter in your credentials to log in. But once you log in, you're going to see a dashboard that looks similar to this. Um, I'm sure if you've had an Azure subscription in the past, you've seen this. You've probably been through this. But if you haven't yet, and this is your first introduction into Azure, um, this is kind of the landing page for your Azure subscription. And so what we have, I'll just give you a brief overview here, is just on this dashboard, we have different tiles that you can customize so that you can make this dashboard work the best for you. So we can see that we, I've got a tile for some resources, service health, et cetera, on here. So we can customize this dashboard for our needs. Also along the left, we've got all these different categories of resources or different resource types. Uh, this can also be customized uh, based upon your specific use. So uh, you might not necessarily need or want all of these different uh, categories over here on the side. 
So you can easily customize this to uh, meet your specific needs. But what we're going to do today is talk more about the, uh, the websites and a component of it called the app service. So before we dive too deep into uh, building out some stuff, I just want to kind of go through um, a description of what an app service is. Um, an app service is the underlying infrastructure that hosts your website. So, for example, think about it like your web server. So if you have an app service plan, an app service plan is going to define basically the size and capabilities of your uh, web host environment. And then you can have one or more web apps running on top of that app service. So you're going to see that as we go forward here, um, you know, kind of some differences there. So that's why when we go to create a new web app, you're going to see that it's also going to talk about creating a new uh, app service plan. So if we were new to this and we wanted to get started to um, build a brand new website and we want to build something in Azure and then maybe migrate something to it, but we, we need to start by creating our uh, website. So what we're going to do is up here in the upper left, just click new. And this is going to bring us to our marketplace. The marketplace shows all the different capabilities and resources that are available uh, inside of the um, Microsoft um, Azure environment. Uh, you can see down here towards the bottom, I've got uh, some recent ones uh, that I can uh, uh, choose also, so things that I've uh, frequently used. And you can see that web app is listed here, and also web app and Linux, which we'll talk about in a moment. But if I didn't have these listed here, there's a couple different ways that I can uh, get to uh, creating a web app. One is I could come down here to web and mobile, and I could click on that, and of course it's going to give me web apps as one of the feature options. Or up here in the marketplace, I could just type in web, and you see that it gives me a drop down for web app. And uh, basically, it's going to filter that and show me you know, a bunch of different things that match that specific um, uh, filter. Now, the first three here, I want to talk about all three of these. So we've got web app. So that would be, you know, we need a web server, and we're going to put an application on it. Web app plus SQL. So if you have an application that you're going to deploy that needs a SQL database, you could do both of them at the same time right here. So I can create a web app and also a SQL database all in one uh, motion. Or if I'm using MySQL, basically the exact same thing. So I create a web app and a MySQL database all in kind of one pass. And then finally, web app on Linux. This is currently in preview and is in Azure commercial only. This is for those of you who have Linux-based websites that you need to uh, host inside of Azure, um, you'll be all set by uh, just go ahead and, and running through that. You'll end up with a, a Linux environment uh, where you can deploy your, your app onto. And we'll look at that here in just a little bit. So what I'm going to do is just go through the basic web app one to show you what this would look like. So if I click on web app, the first thing it's going to do is give us an overview panel. Now, this panel is going to tell us exactly what's going to be created here. It's going to tell you what you can do with it. Um, it's going to tell you that you can develop your site in different flavors of languages, .NET, PHP, Node.js, Python. Java is actually another one. It's not listed here, but that's also available um, in the websites. If I scroll down, we see kind of a, a picture um, of the dashboard for a website and web app. And then down below is the li useful links, which will help you get more information. So if you know that you want to create a web app, but you're not quite sure exactly what all the settings mean, you can come down here and click on documentation. And of course, that'll take you to the appropriate place uh, in our documentation for Azure uh, to walk you through all those steps. But what we're going to do is go ahead and hit create. And it's going to give us a panel for creating our new web app. So the very first thing that we need to do is name our web app. And you're going to see that it's going to end in .azurewebsites.net. So this is going to be basically the domain name that is going to get assigned to your application. Um, it has to be unique, obviously. So if someone else has already used a specific uh, prefix here or, or, or uh, a subdomain name, um, you'll have to uh, uh, select something different. So we have to be very unique. So I'm going to do mhwebcast1. That should be uh, unique enough. So I get the uh, green check mark there, and that's good. Um, now, one of the questions that I usually get is, um, does this mean that I have to publish my app with this specific domain name? 
And the answer is no. Um, you'll have options later on to use your own custom domain name. But when we first build the web app, you actually have to have a unique identifier, a unique domain name for your application. And it's always going to be under azurewebsites.net. Uh, the next thing is going to be your subscription. Now, some of you may have multiple subscriptions in your Azure enrollment, so you'd be able to choose which subscription you'd want to use for your deployment. Uh, you're going to have the option to uh, create or use an existing resource group. So a resource group is um, a way to just group different types of resources together for management purposes. It might be to apply role-based access control. Uh, it might be for um, just overall lifecycle management. Now, I've got one that I already created earlier, so I'm going to say use existing, and I'm going to choose my webcast demo. And then it asks about the app service plan slash location. So one of the things that you need, of course, is an app service plan in order to deploy a web app. Now, the app service plan, kind of think about it as your server that you're putting your website on. Now, you can see that I have some that are already pre-created, so I could go ahead and put it on one of these existing instances. Or if I want to create a new environment specifically for this application, um, I can do that. So um, in this case, we'll do that. So I'm going to go ahead and say Create New. And uh, I want you to see some of the different app service plan options. So the first thing is, is we need to uh, name it. So I'm going to say MH Webcast One Plan. And then we get to choose the location. So where is this going to live? So where in the world do we want our uh, website hosted? Uh, so I'm going to just say North Central US because that's kind of close to where I am. And then we have the pricing tier. This is really, really important. So this is why app service plans um, are important. App service plans come in three different tiers. We've got basic, standard, and premium. And each one of those tiers has different flavors of uh, configuration. And so it's really important for us to go through this because it really defines what you can do with the web apps that you put on this app service plan. So we have with the basic, you'll see that we can have a manual scale of up to three instances when we look at basics. So across the board, basics all have up to three instances. What this basically means is that when we create this, let's say we create a B1 a B1 app tier. It's got one core, 1.75 gigs of RAM. Our application will sit on top of this. It will use some of that 10 gig storage. But if we suddenly have a large load that is going to hit our site, so maybe there's some sort of an event, um, some sort of promotion um, that's happening in the area, and you know you're going to suddenly get a lot of traffic, you might need more than one single web server to actually handle that. So in this basic configuration, you can manually scale up to three instances. So when we scale, it's automatically going to put additional instances of this configuration in a load balanced environment and put your app across it. And we'll see how we scale that a little bit later. But just know that scaling allows you to scale out the number of instances uh, that you are running. You'll also notice that uh, we can do custom domains and SSL support um, at the basic tier. If we go up to the standard tier, uh, some of the big things that change, number one is we can go up to 10 instances instead of just three. So now we can have up to 10 web servers in a load balanced environment running our app. And scaling up is very, very easy to do, so we'll see that. But we also can do what's called auto scale. And so auto scale allows us to scale based on a uh, some sort of a metric, maybe uh, CPU utilization. And so we'll take a look at that here in just a moment. We also get daily backups of our website and our web apps. Um, and then we get five slots for web app staging. So what this basically means is that we will have a production slot for our production web app, but then we can also have additional slots for dev and test that all operate under this one app tier. And the nice thing about this is, is we can do some advanced kind of capabilities. One of them is if we do uh, development and then we do QA testing in one of those slots, we can actually flip the, uh, the, the slot so that the QA slot becomes production and then production gets demoted to QA. So it's really easy to basically turn on updates to an application. So we can swap that really quick and, and turn on those updates. If for some reason what we put into production is not 
you know, operating correctly, we can hit the swap again and swap production back to QA and take what was a, the original production and put it back out there. So it's a really nice kind of a, a DevOps model where it gives you a little more control over the deployment of your code and your applications into a production web slot. One of the other interesting things from a management perspective that this brings to is what we can do called test in production. And it, that might sound a little dangerous, but it's actually a very ingenious way of allowing you to test out um, a change to your application without just fully flipping it on. So what we could do is basically say, I've got this uh, updated application sitting in a QA slot. And I've done all my QA. I believe it's ready for production, but I want to validate it before I just completely turn it on. So what I can do is actually set a percentage of the web traffic coming into our production environment to redirect to that QA server. And so now we can do some of the traffic being handled by production and some of the traffic handled by QA. And you, that way you can monitor the QA for any kind of um, errors or any kind of performance issues before you completely uh, switch it over to be your full production environment. So the web slots are very, very powerful. Uh, the last one, Traffic Manager. So Traffic Manager is basically the ability to have a geographically dispersed load balancer. So the idea is, is you could have websites in multiple um, regions. So we may decide to deploy a web app in, um, let's say, the east region. And we also want to deploy that same exact app in the west region, and we need to load balance between the regions. So that way we have geographic redundancy or resiliency. So Traffic Manager is uh, available for our standard and above tiers, so we can do this um, kind of uh, global load balancer. Now if we jump up to Premium. Premium, lots more storage. We introduce the uh, capability of BizTalk services, so it allows us to do some uh, enterprise integration with our web apps. Increases the number of our instances from 10 to 20. Jumps up our slots from 5 to 20. And then we back up very, very frequently. 50 times a day, we back up your website. So if you ever needed to uh, roll back uh, a change to a website, you would have your backups available. Um, so that's, uh, you know, kind of built in there in, in, in a nice capability. So we'll go ahead and just, for our uh, sake, we're going to go ahead and choose uh, just an S1 standard here. I'll go ahead and hit OK. And so now what we've got is we've got our, our application. We've got our subscription shows, our resource group. We've decided what our app service plan we're going to use. We're going to create a new one, and it's going to be located in North Central U.S., and it's going to be the S1 tier. And then we have this option for application insights. Now, this is available only in Azure Commercial today. Uh, what this is going to allow you to do is to turn on instrumentation for .NET-based applications um, that's running on this. So if this is going to be a .NET-based application, we could turn on Application Insights, and that's going to give you more detailed information about the performance of your application. So things such as page load times, uh, errors, um, those types of things gives you a nice dashboard to be able to really get better insights into your app. Um, for this case, I'm just going to go ahead and leave that off. I hit create, and that's going to go off and uh, publish this for deployments. We see deployment started over here, and that's going to take a few minutes for the deployment uh, to complete. Um, so in the sake of time, I've actually already created uh, a website, so I'm going to go out here and go into my uh, resource group. And I created actually a couple websites. Um, I created one called MH Webcast, and we're going to see that I also created MH Webcast Plan, so that's the plan for it. So those are the ones that I created earlier today. So if I look at MH Webcast Plan, if I click on that, it's going to give me a panel, which is the configuration for this specific app service plan. So this isn't for my website specifically, but for all websites that are using this app service plan. So a couple interesting things. Uh, we see the pricing tier. So I'm using an S1, so a standard one um, uh, uh, size um, tier. 
Uh, we can see the monitoring down here, so memory and CPU usage um, for my uh, application um, plan. Uh, on the left here, we get all sorts of settings that we can go through. And once again, remember, this is going to apply to all apps that are associated with the app service plan. So if I come down here under general and click on apps, we'll actually see that I just have the one app uh, associated to this web uh, uh, app service plan, and uh, it's got a status of running. If I come down here to file system storage, uh, this is going to tell us how much storage are we currently using in our app service plan. Um, depending on the app service plan size you choose, it's going to determine how much storage that you actually have available. So we see here that our threshold is 100 gig, but we're only using 269K currently. So we've got plenty of storage space in our app service plan for additional websites out here. If I click on networking, Networking is more of an advanced feature in an app service plan. This allows me to connect my app service plan to a virtual network that's inside of Azure. Now, the reason why we might want to do this is because we might have a virtual network that we've established in Azure that has a site-to-site -site VPN connection back to your on-premises environment. So if your web app needs to access resources that are on-premises, we could connect this app service plan to a virtual network and then that virtual network would allow this uh, app service plan and any of the apps that are running in it to communicate through that site-to-site -site VPN tunnel back on premises. Down here we have scale up and scale out. So if I click on scale up, this is going to be just changing our pricing tier. So at any point in time that your application's been deployed, if you think that the performance is not to the level that you need or that um, you need more memory, uh, more cores, you can easily come out here and just make a change. So I could go ahead and choose uh, standard S2, hit select, and that would then go ahead and begin the process of upgrading uh, the size of this uh, app service plan. Now the nice thing about this is, is it's, it's really non-disruptive, so um, your website will continue functioning as that uh, process occurs. Um, we also have the other option, which is called Scale Out. So this is that scaling that I was talking about earlier, where we can scale um, up to 10 instances when we're doing a, a standard app service plan. So here we see that I've currently got um, running one instance, and predictive inst instance is at one. So basically, um, I've got this set up manual. So when I have it manual at one and one, it's always going to be at one. And so what I can do down here is if I know... Let's say that um, I've got a event that's going to happen in the local area, and we're putting a website together to promote that event. Maybe it's a charity event, or maybe it's um, some sort of a um, uh, you know some sort of a uh, an event where you have people coming in from out of town, um, you know, to to visit. You may suddenly have a spike on your website. So what we could do is come down here and say, you know what? I want to make sure that we are going to be covered and that we have enough capacity to handle the load that's going to be coming in. We can just grab this and actually slide this up. And maybe I can say, I want five instances of my web server to be running. So we're going to take five instances of that app service plan, and we're going to spread our web site across all five of them. So if all I have to do is hit save. It's going to save that scale setting. And behind the scenes, it's going to start bringing up four additional instances, putting them into load balancers, and making sure that the website is uh, functioning and running on all five of those. So it's that simple to scale up and scale down. This is something that doing on-premises or even doing through other hosters is very, very difficult to do. Um, in this case, you know, we just grab a slider and slide it up. And then let's say that... Uh, the event's over with, but we still want to keep the website up for historical purposes. We know that the uh, amount of load is going to be low, so we can just drop that back down to one, hit save, and now we're saving some money. The website's still up and performing uh, like we expect. But there are some cases where we're not really sure exactly what our load's going to be on our server. Um, it may suddenly go up and, and drop. Uh, one example of this is, is like uh, Department of Transportation a lot of times has uh, applications that they host for showing road conditions. And so if the weather suddenly gets bad, they suddenly have a spike, of course, against their web servers. Everybody wants to see what the roads look like. 
So instead of manually doing this, we can come down here and do this drop down and say we want to do it by a CPU percentage. And I know that the weather can change quickly, so I can suddenly have a, a really quick hit to my server. So instead of running a single instance at the low end, I might say, you know what? I want to have no less than two instances always running of my uh, app service plan for my websites. And at most, though, I want to make sure that I'm not paying too much. I'm going to come down here and set it at most five uh, instances running. And from a CPU range, I'm going to say, you know what, I want a range of approximately, you know, 20% maybe. So we'll say on the low end, if it drops below 20%, we're going to uh, drop an instance. And if we go above, let's say, 85%, we want to add instances. So basically what this means is that if I set it up like this, I will always have two instances of my uh, app service plan running. At most, I will have five running and what I want to do is target a CPU range between 20 and 85 percent and this is an average uh, a CPU across all the running instances so let's say that we've got the minimum number of instances running we've got two of them running and my CPU average across those two exceeds 85 percent what's going to happen is that Azure will automatically add another instance, so bringing that up to three, in order to drop that CPU utilization down under 85%. Okay, And so it will continue to automatically manage it so that you have good availability and good performance of your application. And then you can also go down here and set up uh, notifications so that you can get notified uh, when these scaling actions occur, so it's not just kind of a surprise to you. Um, you can get keep track of that. So that's basically what an app service plan is. It gives you the ability to set the size of the underlying infrastructure that you're using. Uh, it allows you to scale uh, up or down uh, the size if you need and also scale out based on either a manual configuration or a automated configuration by CPU. So once we have our app service plan configured the way that we want, we can go in and look at our website itself. So if I go into my website here, that's running on my app service plan, here we're going to see a nice general overview of the uh, website. The first thing that we see up here in the upper uh, right is the URL. And if I click on that, there's my website. So uh, Anybody, if you guys enter in this URL, which is mhwebcast.azurewebsites.net, you'll see this uh, screen come up right now. So this is just kind of the default splash screen that you get uh, on any new website that you create. So uh, we have lots of configuration options for a website. I'm not going to go through all of them. I just want to highlight a couple. Um, one, we talked about those deployment slots. So being able to have multiple deployment slots and then being able to swap between deployment slots. Well, that's going to be all configured right here uh, under deployment slots. So we can come in here and we can add additional slots. By default, you have your production slot. And that's it. But if we add additional slots, they will show up here. And you'll see that swap button that allows us to swap uh, slots uh, around. So we can swap the QA slot into the production slot, et cetera. So just know that that's where you go to do that. Um, now, I'm going to talk a little bit about your migration here and a little bit about deployment um, for websites. So now that we've created this, this website and we've got this out here, um, now you're going to want to uh, go through the process of bringing your application into Azure. So how do we do that? Uh, you've got a couple of options. One of them is Visual Studio. So if you're doing any work in Visual Studio, um, that is one of the best ways to actually uh, publish into Azure because uh, Visual Studio uses a capability called Web Deploy. And Web Deploy will connect into the Azure website and upload your application with just a couple clicks of a button inside of Visual Studio. So that's probably the easiest way to get an application uh, up and running inside of uh, Azure. Now, uh, in some cases, inside of Visual Studio, um, you can um, deploy 
With Web Deploy, either by using your credentials, so basically logging in with your username and password that you would use for logging into the portal, or up here at the top, we have this thing called a publishing profile. And basically, it's a configuration XML file that has some uh, information that tells Visual Studio or other third-party solutions how to deploy into this uh, website. So you do have those two options um, for, for deployment using Web Deploy. Um, the other way of doing deployment is very much like we've done for years, and that's basically using FTP. So you're going to see here that we have a FTP deployment username, and we also have the host names uh, right here um, on, on the right of our panel. So what we could use is use that FTP site and that username to connect to the FTP site and just upload the code for our website. Now, uh, you're probably wondering, well, what's the password for our FTP? Over here in the left, there's this deployment credentials option. Uh, you can click on that, um, come in here, and you can actually set the, uh, the password for your um, FTP account for uh, your website. So that way you can go ahead and uh, publish via FTP. So, like I said, the, the two major ways of getting your applications out there is going to be either uh, web deploy or FTP. There is another option, which we call continuous delivery. This is actually in preview today. Um, what we're able to do is actually connect to um, other automated build systems. Um, so maybe we're going to use Visual Studio Online or maybe uh, Git, uh, GitHub to be, um, go out and uh, grab the changes as they occur and then deploy them into your website. So this is really good for those scenarios where you're just doing development. So if you're doing a lot of development, um, you might have a source control system. Con connect this up to your source control system. It'll pull down the code and deploy it automatically into um, your website so you can constantly test it. So that's kind of an interesting capability. So that's really the third option that you've got for uh, deploying uh, an application um, out here into uh, the Azure websites. Uh, down here, there's a couple things I wanted to point out, uh, other additional settings. We've got this application settings section. This is important because this is where you're going to set up um, basically how your web app inside of Azure functions. Uh, so one, if you need to change things like the .NET Framework version, PHP versions, if you want to turn on Java or Python and select the versions of those uh, um different uh, uh, products, you can go ahead and do that right through here. Um, choosing 64 or 32-bit uh, platforms, whether you need integrated or classic pipelines. So if you're running some older uh, .NET applications, you might need to switch over to a classic pipeline. Um, and there's lots of other things. I'm not going to go through all these, but just be aware that there's a lot of settings here that you can use, um, including debugging um, that you can turn on and off for your website. Um, now, there are a few things that I do want to point out. App settings and connection strings. And this is really important for our .NET developers. Um, our .NET developers typically will use the web.config file um, when they're building out their applications to store things such as app settings or connection strings. Um, that's okay if you are going to manually manage that during deployment. But in many cases, there is going to be different values for some of your app settings or maybe your connection strings when you're moving between QA and production. So what this allows you to do is actually configure those settings here. And any of the settings that you do here will override what's inside of your web.config file. So it makes it very nice and convenient. Um, that also allows you to get things that might be considered secrets outside of a plain text file and actually bring it into the Azure portal environment itself. Um, down here below, some additional things if you need to modify default documents, handlers, and virtual applications and directories, you can do all of that right through here through settings. Another interesting thing that you can do with web apps, um, authentication and authorization. So if you've got an application that you're building and you want people to be able to log into it, but you don't want to go through the process of building out all of that log in kind of logic, you can actually just come out here and say you want to turn on app service authentication and then choose which service you want people to log in with. And as you can see, we could do Azure Active Directory, Facebook, Google, Microsoft accounts, and Twitter. 
And so if you do this, if you configure the authentication provider and turn that on, anytime a person goes to your app, they'll be required to log in using one of those uh, pre-configured authentication providers. Um, now, the thing about this is, is this protects the whole application. That means you're not going to have an anonymous landing page, okay? Um, this means as soon as they hit that web app, they're going to be prompted to log in. So most enterprises that are building enterprise applications probably won't use this, but it is a nice little feature uh, that's available out there. Now, I'm just going to kind of scroll through uh, some of these other options uh, that we have out here just so you can see them. Um, for example, backups. If you want to set up a backup schedule for your website, we can do this. Now, you see here uh, SQL database is actually showing here. So if you created one of those web plus SQL configurations um, and your website is connected to a SQL database, we can actually back up both the website and the SQL database all in one right through this backup. So a very, very nice capability. Um, and then uh, you have your restore right from this location. So very, very easy to set up, um, nice capabilities um, to be able to, uh, to protect yourself. Um, if I go down here a little bit further, we've got this one called My SQL in App, and this is in preview. Um, what this allows you to do is if you're going to build a development environment, this wouldn't be for production, but for development, and you're going to build something that's going to use MySQL as the data store, you can actually just come out here and turn on MySQL, and you'll have a MySQL database instance that's going to be available to your web app. Now, the reason why we say don't do this for production is because it will not scale beyond a single instance. So um, if you've got a small website that's not going to be hit very hard, well, then this might work for you. But if you're going to have anything that you need to scale out, um, this will not work in a scale-out scenario. So just be, be aware of that. So it's not really intended for production environments. But if you do need a, a MySQL database for something that you're building and uh, it's you know one of your websites, this is a really quick, simple way to uh, get up and going with that. Um, now, there's a lot of other things down here as we go down to development tools. Lots of additional tools that you can use for um, managing and debugging your application. So you'll see that we can get console access. So if I click on console here, um, how about being able to be dropped to a, a command prompt for your um, server? So there we go. So now I'm on my uh, uh, you know app service plan server, and I can go ahead and you know look around, do directories, etc. Um, right here, so kind of a cool way of being able to get access uh, into my environment. So if I need to kind of look around, uh, see what's going on. Um, things such as performance testing, uh, PHP debugging, uh, those are all additional things that are available. We come down here to monitoring, lots of great things with monitoring. Um, we can watch live HTTP traffic as it comes in and out of uh, the environment. Um, we can see uh, diagnostic logs um, of what's going on within our environment. So we have lots of capabilities here for monitoring and managing uh, our websites that uh, you know a lot of other hosters have never uh, made available to people in the past. So if I come back over here to our overview, and you see here that we've got uh, a few requests that have been uh, made to this uh, site, so we see some nice uh, requests, and if we had any errors that are happening that are HTTP server errors, of course, we'd see them here, so that's having an interesting capability. But I want to go ahead and launch back into my website here, and I want to see show you another capability that we have. If we come up here to mhwebcast.azurewebsites.net, if we add in another uh, little bit here. So after our domain name that we entered in, if we put SCM and hit dot again, so it's now mhwebcast.scm.azurewebsites.net, I hit enter. This is going to take me to a, a environment we call Kudu, which gives you additional details and information about your running web app. So it's a really nice kind of capability here. Uh, the thing that I like about this is environment. If I hit environment, I immediately see everything that's configured uh, for this environment, such as the OS, how long has the system been up, what are our working directories, what are my app settings that are active, what are my connection strings that are active, environmental variables. So these are all things 
that might be important to you as a developer or um, as a uh, you know administrator of the environment as you're trying to identify or debug certain things that might be going on with your applications. Uh, under the debug console, um, just like we saw in the other window there, um, we can get a command prompt. Uh, this one looks a little different because we actually show the, the file structure of where you're at in your command prompt uh, above in the web. But, you know, a nice command prompt here that allows us to have console access uh, to our website. Uh, I can also, if I prefer PowerShell, jump over and do the same thing but run a PowerShell command uh, right there. I have Processes Explorer, so if I want to see the processes that are currently running on my server, I can also hit Properties and get even more detailed information about the, uh, the, the, the site that's out there uh, running, so things such as memory pools, et cetera. So other stuff that sometimes can be very valuable to um, our developers. And then finally, site extensions. This allows you to add additional extensions into your site. So if I click on Gallery here, we're going to see that there's a lot of additional extensions that we can bring into our website. So this is additional code or additional capabilities that you can deploy into your website. So things such as a PHP manager or a site replicator, um, you know, that we can easily, quickly add in. So, for example, like this IS manager. If I wanted to add this in, all I have to do is click on install, say that I want to install it. It's going to take a moment, and then once it's uh, installed on my website, it's going to tell me that I need to restart my site. So I'll go ahead and hit restart. And it'll take just a minute. And now if I go over to installed, now it shows that it's installed. I've got a little play button here. If I click that, it's going to launch me over into um, whatever that extension does. So, um, you know, that's kind of a neat concept for websites is to be able to extend your existing websites with additional capabilities and functions by being able to install, um, you know, additional uh, extensions and components here. So... I'll go ahead and close that. If we didn't want that extension anymore, uh, it's simple enough. Just hit the X to remove from the installed area, and it will go ahead and remove that back out of our, our website. All right. So a couple other things that I want to talk about. Uh, so far, everything that I've shown has been on Windows-based um, uh, servers. Okay, So this has all been Windows-based uh, websites. So that'd be .NET, PHP, Java, etc. But what if you wanted something that was hosted on Linux? Well, we have that capability in Azure Commercial today. It's not in Azure Government yet. But in Azure Commercial, we have a preview capability, which is Website on Linux. And Website on Linux allows us to create a Linux app service plan, which you can see right here. We got the little Linux guy. And if I click on this, this is actually a web server, just like uh, the other ones, but it is running on Linux. Now, you'll notice that I have only the ability to scale out. I don't have the ability to scale up. So this is kind of important. When you create a Linux app service today, um, you have to make sure you choose the size that's appropriate for your application. To kind of think a little bit of ahead. Um, we can scale out. We just can't scale up. Uh, currently. Um, otherwise, you know, very similar. You have your file storage. You'd see the apps um, that are running on the app service plan. So this gives you the ability to run things like Node.js or other, um, you know, web applications that, that you would normally deploy on a Linux-based uh, system. Okay. So, you know, we've run through quite a bit in a very short period of time. We've talked about, you know, website creation. We've talked about migrating your websites and whether they're Linux websites or whether they're, uh, you know, Windows-based or .NET-based uh, websites, you can uh, bring them over. Uh, for Linux, it's all going to be about FTP, okay? So you're going to use FTP to deploy your websites. Um, if you're talking about um, .NET, it's all going to be um, normally web deployed by using Visual Studio or you can use FTP also um, to get those out there. Um, of course, if you're going to do continuous deployments, you could look at using um, things like Git or Visual Studio Online to also publish into your websites as uh, developers check in their code. Um, 
since this is a platform as a service, I guess kind of one of the final things that I, I want to make sure that you understand is that you can run pretty much any web application that you have today in either a uh, Windows or Linux web app in Azure as long as it doesn't require OS level hooks. So if your web application ties into system registries or things like that that are OS hooks, um, you'll need to reevaluate those applications and decide if there's other ways that you could um, maybe modify them so that it doesn't require hooks directly into the underlying OS. And the reason why um, that's important is, is one, is that scale out capability. Is as we scale out, um, you know, we're going to be bringing on new servers, and as we scale back down, we're going to be removing servers. So things that are that are hooked into the OS itself. Um, really uh, won't function well um, in a Azure uh, web app environment. But there's always ways around that. So, for example, you know, in the past I've seen um, organizations that use registry to store, like, connection strings. But like I showed you, is you could actually use um, instead the application settings of the web app to store the uh, connection strings. Um, or you could use uh, something like uh, Azure Key Vault and have your uh, application reach out to the Key Vault to get uh, those types of secrets and use those. Um, I know we've covered quite a bit. We've got about 12 minutes or so left. Why don't I go ahead and just open it up for any kind of questions, uh, comments, thoughts, things that you want to uh, know about. Great presentation, Mike. Uh, in, any questions for Mike? <clears throat> if you're uh, if you're on mute and you're talking, you might need to uh, unmute yourself. <laughs> but uh, ho hopefully, not for uh, me. No. <laughs> okay. Good. Well, hopefully this was helpful. I mean, the the big thing to think about, you know, we talked primarily about websites here. But, uh, you know, like I said, we also have other platforms of service capabilities, one of them being SQL databases. So if you have an application that requires a SQL database, you don't have to still think about running a SQL server um, in a virtual machine. You can just come out here into Azure and just say, I need a SQL database. And you can easily spin up right through this UI a new database, and now you've got your database back end for your web app. And you've got your web app all hosted right there in Azure in a nice, safe, and secure environment that's very scalable and can uh, address a lot of that scalability needs. And I think that's probably one of the biggest benefits of using Azure Web Apps is that ability to scale up and scale down and scale out when necessary. So you can really optimize your costs for your websites um, while also ensuring that you have great performance on them. Absolutely. Definitely, you should all consider this for, especially for citizen-facing type of web solutions that you might have. You, you know, actually, there is one other thing, too, Steve, since we do have a couple minutes and we're not getting any questions. Um, one of the things I want to point out is the marketplace. The marketplace is really good, especially if you're on the commercial side, um, you're going to have a little bit more in the marketplace than you do on the government side. But we have some pre-built uh, solutions that are out here uh, in the marketplace. So if I come out here into Web and Mobile and I do see all, um, we've got a lot of platform-based web apps that are available. So um, if you want like .NET Nuke and you don't want to go through the process of installing .NET Nuke yourself, you can come out here and just say, I want to deploy a .NET Nuke instance, and it will walk you through the process of building that website and the app service plan, and then it will deploy .NET Nuke for you um, on that environment. Same goes with these uh, these other environments. I'll kind of jump back here and hit more. We've got a lot of them out here. So it's a great way to kind of jump start uh, something that you need to do. You know, we've got Drupal. So we've got a lot of people that use Drupal for content management. Um, you know, if you need a bug tracker, we've got bug.net. So there's lots of great things that are out here in this uh, web apps directory that with just a few clicks, you can actually not just have a website, but actually have a full solution uh, deployed inside your uh, Azure subscription. Yeah, I know there's a lot of interest in, in WordPress customers. 
especially in the in um, government. <clears throat> Absolutely, absolutely. WordPress is one of probably the more popular uh, uh, platforms that we, we see out there uh, these days. All right. Well, hey, great job, Mike. Really appreciate it. So um, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your day, especially on your Friday, to attend this. Um, this was, I thought, super informative. So um, kudos to Mike. Great job. Um, any, uh, any other questions for Mike on this topic? No, but it was very informative. Thank you kindly. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend, and thanks so much for taking time out to uh, spend time with me today. Hear me ramble on. <laughs> thanks, Mike. And hey, for everybody, before you drop, um, this I am recording this, and so I will be uh, shooting out to everybody that that was on the invite the the link for um, going to view this. So if you if you know of folks that might be interested in this, you'll you'll be able to share that with them. All right. Well, thank you very much.